there's nothing wrong w w with video uh, as a format, anything like that. Um, the reason why that um, we see static work and, and win most of the time. Welcome to Marketers Talking Marketing, the podcast where marketers get together to talk marketing. Today, we have a topic that I'm super, super excited for because I think it's going to challenge your preconceived notions of which content, what content does best on social media. So we are joined with Kevin. Do you want to give a quick introduction and let's just jump right into it? Sure. Yeah. You know, um, I've been doing marketing since I was 17 in, in various ways. Uh, but for the last 10 years or so, I've been doing focusing mostly on B2B advertising. Um, I worked in-house at a company called On Deck Capital um, and then became a consultant for a few years and then founded my own agency, uh, Right Percent, which just focuses on B2B advertising, uh, especially in digital. Yeah. And this is not necessarily related to today's topic. Maybe it'll tie into it. But I actually found Kevin because he ch he shares a lot of really great charts and graphs. And I was like, this guy is so valuable and his content is so helpful. And there's a few of them that I put into decks that I was presenting. And so I would recommend everyone also check out Kevin's LinkedIn because a lot of really good content is coming out on his feed. Um, but let's jump into content. So what content are you finding is performing best on LinkedIn? Yeah. So um, but by content, you mean like organic content? Um, yeah. Organic, yeah. paid, all the whole in between. Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, I've experimented with a lot of things um, on LinkedIn and, you know, I can't say I, I'm the best, you know, I have my, my niche area of people interested in, in B2B advertising and it's grown a lot. Um, but uh, the stuff that I, I've seen work is I start with, uh, you know, something original, like, you know, an, an article on something. So, you know, uh, later in this podcast episode, we're going to be talking about creative. So you start with an essay on creative um, and then you think of different ways that you can make that content more accessible because um, now like most things these days on social media platforms, people like to stay on the platform. You don't want to, you know, click off and then go read like, you know, a whole article or you do, but it has to be a really good article. Um, it's a much lower barrier if you keep it on the platform. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've done is basically, you know, take that that base article, you split it into a, a deck, which you can post on LinkedIn. You turn it uh, like one of those little infographics that you like. You can just take, you know, to encapsulate an idea as briefly as you can. And then you can post that on LinkedIn. And that's the kind of stuff that both I've seen work, but also I've got messages from people like yourself, like, oh, this is really helpful. These little, you know, snippets of information. And I think the platforms also reward that keeping people on platform. I find on the advertising side, you know, if you're running a lead gen form or just straight promoting content on LinkedIn versus sending someone to your sending someone to your website, I'm yeah. all jumbled in my words. <laughs> yeah. Um, LinkedIn likes it and it'll tend to perform better and get served more often. So I think that's definitely definitely true for the the platforms. You're playing into what they want to see for good performance and good content. Um, and that cost of clicking on leaving is high. Like if I can get for me as a user, just thinking through it, I feel like if I click off a site and go to click off of LinkedIn, for example, and go to a website, I have to read a ton. But often on LinkedIn, I'm getting like the really concise, boiled down, just the valuable parts of it. So it almost feels like it, it is a big ask, I think, for people to leave the platform and go read content externally. Um, now, how do you so when it comes to creatives, you and I have talked to a lot about static and I, I see you post quite a bit. A lot of the rhetoric right now is that video is king, video dominates. I mean, people are likely consuming this content as video or audio content. <laughs> so a little ironic with it. But you've been finding a lot of success with static creatives. You mentioned PowerPoints, uh, images. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, you, you know, and uh, this is primarily, you know, when normally when I talk about um, how static works better for our clients, and I'll, I'll get into to why in a second. I'm talking about on the advertising side, right? So, so when we're spending money on LinkedIn and Facebook ads with the goal of getting ROI from that, that we can measure. So you spend a dollar, you make $2. Um, so so th that's the frame of context with that, that I'm looking at this problem at. And um, I don't think there's nothing wrong w w with video uh, as a format, anything like that. Um, the reason why that um, we see static work and, and win most of the time um, which, as you mentioned, Jess, is like a bit of a, against the uh, 
the, the zeitgeist of of what people talk about nowadays. Like, you know, you need UTC. My theory for it is that if you're selling a consumer product, um, like a t-shirt or a toaster or a new type of flosser or whatever, um, the product is physical and it speaks for itself. Um, so you don't necessarily need text associated with that. Um, and then a video shows the product more than a static would. Um, so like, you know, that's why UGC user generated content is so successful these days because it just in its purest form is someone authentically using the product. But what if you're advertising something that is abstract? It's not immediately obvious. It's not a t-shirt you can see. It's a software that helps HR companies, you know, manage their, uh, how they pay hourly workers. Um, the only way to, to, uh, to say what the product does is through text. Um, it's not possible purely through visuals. And then once you have text there, it's just a matter of getting that initial text, what we call the visual headline, like the, the text on the ad image, shown as quickly as possible to the user and testing a lot of different versions of that text. Now you can do that in a video. You know, you can have a video that, I remember most people are on mute when they're first scrolling their feed, they have to unmute. So you can have a video that has text, but you end up being able to just test more of that positioning statement text faster with static which is why I think static almost always wins, um, at least in our B2B accounts. It's a matter of getting out, just testing those different positioning statements for different products because the products can't speak for themselves. They need words. Um, so th that's why just initial philosophy. I know it just spoke for like five yeah. minutes. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, do you Are you running on LinkedIn and like Facebook and Instagram or is a lot of your testing predominantly on LinkedIn since it's a B2B audience? Yeah, yeah you know, it, it's a, a good question. Um, so about across everything our, my agency does, it's like a third Facebook, a third LinkedIn, and a third search. Um, the difference between uh, Facebook and, and LinkedIn, and Facebook, you know, I'm rolling all of meta, Instagram, it tends to be better for like what I call beta SMB. Uh, so like targeting restaurant owners or targeting salon owners. Like that on Facebook is sort of the golden spot. Um, any kind of bigger audience of people like also bottoms up and developers works better on Facebook while like enterprise targeting. I go to LinkedIn. So like that traditional B2B going after the d director of, uh, of, you know, information technology at a fortune 1000 company, that kind of thing. That's where I go to LinkedIn for. Okay, cool. Um, so are you leveraging, you mentioned also having text and video. Are you leveraging that as a type of creative also quite a bit, or is it mainly like static images with different tests that you're texting? Ted? Yeah. Test? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, text that you were testing. 90% static w with text that, that, that I'm testing. Um, I know that this is mostly a podcast. Uh, sh should I share my screen briefly and yeah, show one of those visuals? Is, okay. If you're listening yeah. on Spotify or other channels, you can also look at the video on YouTube. Yeah. And I'll, I'll read it out loud yeah. as well. Um, so Perfect. let me. It's like when you're share. testing food on camera, you have to describe it also so people can get the the sense of what they're eating yeah it, oh, so it, exactly you're, you're building in google slides too just like a little behind the scenes snippet there that's interesting because yep. i i love to build images in powerpoint and when yep. i tell people that they look at me like i just recommended microsoft outlook and they're like what do you what do you mean I'm like it's just so much easier to build images in powerpoint sometimes <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, there there are tools nowadays nowadays that are good as well, like Canva. But I'm gonna like it just has everything I need. It easily I can download any slide, I can copy and paste, I can do everything. It's 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 fun. Um, but but you know, for those of you at home, basically, this is um, a chart I have of channel targeting, um, and you can see basically the fewer decision makers you have. That's the the blue triangle here. Um, and for those in the podcast, it's like a, a blue triangle with the, the fat part on top. Um, the fewer decision makers you have, the more you leave sort of the Facebook and TikTok and the more you get onto LinkedIn. Um, so just a, a helpful data viz. Um, the other thing I wanted to add on creative. So we just talked about um, how uh, text is so important on creative and especially B2B creative. But this type of ad this dumb, simple ad. I'm showing an ad that um, the text is like the entire the entirety of the ad. There's not even an image behind it. Offer the ultimate meal perk to your employees is the text of one. Um, if I go into a, the second most popular type of ad, meaning the one that wins the most in accounts, 
it's checklist ad. It's like a big text dense ad uh, where it's mostly text. And those are the winners most of the time. And it's not at all what like uh, a brand person would expect. That's the kind of text we're constantly trying to test in the Ed Beats videos. Do you run into challenges with promoting images with so much text? N- no. So Facebook used to have something called the 20% rule. Yeah. Um, but they got rid of that about a year ago. Um, so, so we haven't had any issues since. Cool. I mean, it's also so value added in the examples you showed. I think for the user to be able to understand how that would benefit them and impact them, it's right there. It's like your value statements. Bam, bam, yep. bam. And bold. I was going to say bold colors, not all bold colors, but definitely starkly contrasting colors. So like orange on black, white on black. Um, that's really interesting. I will admit I have not done anything that text heavy in a long time. But that's really interesting that that's where it makes sense uh, cognitively, like thinking through it, that that would perform well. But yeah, definitely very interesting. Do you find that there's a size? I saw a lot of the examples you showed are one by one. Are you also testing like the larger image sizes on LinkedIn? Yeah. You know, um, we find that one by one works well enough in most cases. You know, going back to the the idea of reducing friction, um, I try to... um, Facebook and LinkedIn ads both work via power law when deciding like which ads work. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, just like with venture capital investing, you know, you do a hundred investments and like one of them makes you all your money back. Right. With advertising, it's the same thing. Like almost everything we do, at least 19 out of 20 new ads that we test are going to die, you know, on, on the ad platform floor. If they're going to get a couple hundred dollars spend, the platform's going to say this isn't doing well enough and the algorithm's going to shut them down. So I'm always looking for ways to reduce friction in testing, get more ideas out the door. Um, so we have more of a chance of hitting those lottery winner creatives, which can like transform an ad account. What should people keep in mind if they're going to start adopting, if they're going to start testing, I would say before even adopting, test everything, you know, see what it works for your audience. What should people keep in mind if they're going to start testing more static images, more text heavy images, more images in general, or video that's text heavy in the initial seconds? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the big thing to keep in mind is getting the attention of your target decision maker in a second. Um, So uh, you have to be very mindful of who your decision maker is. Uh, So for instance, uh, when we work with DoorDash, it's very, we have to be very clear in an ad that this is for, you know, restaurants signing up, not for people who want to be dashers and want to deliver. Um, And, you know, the the reason for that is there's a lot more dashers out there and they'll pollute your your ad like learnings and your signups and and so on. Um, And this is true for so, so many industries where like, you know, even if you're selling like e-commerce, right, you want to attract the users who are going to have like bigger cart sizes rather than smaller. Um, And and so that's the biggest advice, like call out that target market immediately in B2B. It's easy, like attention, you know, HR, you know, decision makers or small business owners. Um, and then call out benefits and features which are specific to their needs, you know, specificity, credibility, concreteness. Um, that's why those text heavy ads work so well, because they can be so concrete about, you know, these are like the benefits we're offering and that can meet your needs. Yeah. Are you also testing different copy text copy in the post or do you find it's really just secondary and doesn't like people, if they've read the image, that's what's going to decide if they're going to engage or not. And they aren't, aren't as compelled by the text in the post itself. That, that's a great question. Um, and the answer is, you know, we do test it, but the impact is much smaller. So uh, roughly 70% of the performance of any ad can be explained by just the text on the ad um, and nothing to do with the design, just the text. And uh, what well, we call that the visual headline because it's the text like on the, the main visual. Um, and then, you know, 20% of the ads explained by the actual image and then 10%, I would put at the text in the top and bottom, the main copy and the, and the CTA. Did you test different sizing? Do you find that one by one is winning? Does it matter as much? Oh, oh yeah. Yes. So I was just getting to that be, uh, before the, um, I find that one by one going back to that principle of like simple and reduced friction, it fits in the most areas um, so that most of the time we just make one by one. So it works really well on newsfeed. It works well in Instagram story format. So even the story has room for a vertical box, um, like this square, you know, goes in the middle and just lets your other text be accentuated. Um, so, so yes, I, I recommend one, one. I don't recommend complicating it with like a bunch of different um, uh, 
cuts. It's interesting. So I ran a test earlier this year. I want to say May, April, May, probably. And I noticed that one of the accounts I look to on LinkedIn for what's going to work in marketing is HubSpot. I feel like they're often very... Uh, my This sweater is kind of on brand for them, actually. Um, but I feel like they're often on... They adapt things that are going to be working well in the future. They're ahead of the curve with it. And I noticed like, that... <laughs> I noticed on LinkedIn, HubSpot was doing a ton of text ads with no images at all. And so we tested image versus video versus just text, like a paragraph or two of text. And text was performing really, really well for a while. And it kind of made my brain itch a little bit because I was like, "Where? there's nothing here. There's no asset. I've noticed recently, I went and looked at their page today, that they have PDF ads, uh, image, gal- like image, not carousel, but the you know, where they put the word I'm looking for is escaping me. They have a lot of images, uh, but they're not really, they had video like a month or so ago, but they're not running a lot of video. It's mainly also images. Yeah. It, it, it's definitely become more, more common. Probably just people are seeing the data and seeing what works just like, just like you did. And uh, on the text ad, I actually really love experimenting with that format. So I, I know it goes against what I just said, that the visual headline is everything, but like, this is a example ad that was pure text only on Facebook that did super well uh, again. So, you know, what it says for those on the, on the, the podcast, um, the ad starts with the only text that shows is dear child care director. Thank you for caring for our littlest. Um, and then if they click, they see more of this personal message. It, it's for bright wheels trying to get people to sign up for um, you know, like daycares and child care centers to sign up for so- their software. Um, but th- this kind of ad worked really well w- with really just like it looking so not like an ad um, that, you know, it, it gets attention. It really also, the, the copy itself, I think, pulls to the heartstrings of probably their child care providers. It's, you know, thank you for caring for our littlest learners every day. Let us help you spend more time nurturing young minds and streamlining your operations and reducing administrative work. Bam, value added right there. Yeah. So, yeah, I know that is really interesting. I I think it's so, I find it very interesting the people who will, you know, push these very black and white things of what works and what doesn't. And there are people who will say video, you have to do video, 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 put out like seven reels a day on TikTok and like a million Instagram posts and video everywhere. And like, and I am also, I say that with me also putting out a ton of video content right now, but there's so much room for experimentation. And I think sometimes the stuff that we don't think works, there's still an appetite for. Because if your feed is entirely video and then you just see, a text post from a brand that might disrupt your day and make you look at it a different way than if it was another video of someone talking about it. It's so much easier, I think, to probably produce static images and just text ads too. Versus Definitely. needing yeah. to get like a person corralled together and a script and yeah, and and storyboarding process. and uh, like I, I would say the average video ad takes like twenty times the time of a text yep. ad. I got a dirty, dirty secret. <laughs> I used to work for a company where we were like sometimes like the third or fourth person that they would outsource campaigns to for um, promoted campaigns on Facebook and Instagram at the time. And so we did a campaign for a restaurant that was dropping a beloved seasonal food item was coming back. And so they had this like really, you know, tear jerking video of like the farmer making food and it went in and it was this whole thing and it was like 10 minutes long we're like first off you can't promote that so don't give me a 10 minute long at the time you couldn't promote it on facebook um but the agency you know they love video content and they bill a lot more for video content and so they had all these videos and they had a static image of just the food you know like coming together or sorry gif of like the food coming together and then some static imagery the static images and the GIF did the best versus the video. And so I went back to the agency and said, hey, like, you know, your your video's trash, bro. Like, what are you doing? Like, the videos aren't performing well. <laughs> like, oh, my God, you can't tell the client that. It's like, but it's not working well. And I saw that repeatedly that there are people who are just, it's in their best interest for people to produce more video because they make more money on it. When really, it doesn't mean it's actually going to be the best performing. And ultimately... You know, we're measuring engagement in the platform, click throughs on the link to go to the the restaurant finder page, and then people who are actually engaging and like finding their restaurant and getting directions. So like we're tracking conversions throughout this funnel, uh, but video never videos never really perform the best when compared to other assets I found historically. But I feel like we never want to talk about that <laughs> because yeah. so many people are invested in video. 
you know, video content. Yeah. I want that makes me wonder too if on TikTok, if you made a short loop video that was predominantly text coming through. I mean, actually, as I say that, I can think of a ton of TikToks I've seen where the background's like someone walking in a path and then they have, you know, that inspirational audio over it and then they'll have like the text, you know, the captions coming through. And I feel like I see a ton of those actually. So I was just going to say it'd be interesting to test it on TikTok, but clearly brands are doing that. Yeah, yeah, the, the, definitely. And uh, as if TikTok ever grows to the extent where they have, you know, um, uh, like every type of user, like like Facebook does, yeah. instead of kind of just the the TikTok, which is still a little bit you know younger and more looking to be entertained, um, th- then they'll move into products which are more abstract, and then text will be even more important. I've seen a growing number of people my age on TikTok. <laughs> I'm going to say mm-hmm. the the feed yeah. is also probably you know skewing it toward towards me, but I feel like it is a growing demographic yeah. on there. Assuming TikTok uh, stays legal in the U.S. and that. <laughs> Regulators are able to find a happy spot with data privacy and everything. We actually have for listeners at home, we have coming up in a future episode, Silvio Perez joining us to talk TikTok ads. So that'll be coming back because right now those are doing really, really well for the B2B side and they're really inexpensive compared to a lot of other platforms for it because they're probably still trying to grow it. Yeah. I, w- I, w- I want to watch that very much. <laughs> yes. Have yeah. you tested any TikTok advertising yet? So, so yes, what we found um, is that it works on the micro B two B. So I mentioned I, I mentioned like B two SMB, like restaurants, uh, traditional B two B. Then there's even smaller ones. I call them micro B two B, targeting freelancers, targeting you, you know that kind of uh, very broad audience that still might be B two B. That's where I've seen TikTok work. Uh, but I, I have I have not been able to crack it in the smaller audiences. I can definitely see that. I think there's a lot of freelancers. Um, again, uh, who knows what, what it actually looks like. It's all based on my feed, <laughs> my opinions are with it, but yeah, we'll definitely keep you posted on that and, uh, excited to hear if you have any updates on your testing, you know, come back and let the audience know what works and what doesn't in B2B advertising, creative content space. I just jumbled all that into one thing, <laughs> but, I, and it, it's all one glorious, messy thing. Yeah. It was a pleasure to be here today, Jess. Thank you. And if people are interested though, where, where can they go to find? So definitely I would encourage everyone to go check out Kevin's LinkedIn. We'll put in the show notes below. Where can people go to find more content from you? And if they want to work with you, where should they, where should they go? It, it's all found in one glorious, uh, centralized place, which is right percent.com. Um, and, uh, there's old interviews there and lots of content and decks and, uh, articles and so on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see everyone on the next episode. Pew, pew.